The world of video games is a deep and expansive terrain with an enormous variety to suit almost all personalities. And from Space Invaders, released in 1978, making a worldwide presence in every arcade store, to world record games of modern times like those of World of Warcraft, video games now have a history spanning back many decades, and they continue to grow and offer entertainment for millions all over the world. Back in the early stages of gaming development, it became very obvious to the pioneers of the new gaming venture that children, they were a primary consumer, and so they became a target market waiting to be tapped into. And with decades of experience honing the art of gaming marketing, the industry set a strong tone early on that was consistent with what younger generations desired. Over the years, many games have been specifically designed for a wide audience that would include adults, but also seek to captivate younger audiences. And with the boom of games like Pokemon back in the 90s, games designed to include children have only become more prolific with time. Typically, these types of games feature a host of likeable characters with various age-appropriate elements, and striking the balance in order to challenge adults as well as cushion the psychology of children, it has proved challenging at times. And although challenging, the endeavor to include younger audiences has been pursued under the consensus of ethical principles which have guided the gaming culture and industry for many years. However, as time has transpired, every now and then, a game appears under this genre with elements that would challenge this ethical consensus. Some of this challenging is featured in a more outright manner, while others feature more secretively. And perhaps this is what makes some of these moments so dark. After all, the expectation seems to be that games that try to incorporate a younger audience should often translate into a game with little to no violence or adult themes. But before I begin, I would just like to remind everyone that while some troubling elements may exist within the following games, in no way am I attempting to shed a bad light on any of them. In fact, I love these games all the more for the truly suspenseful and morbid realities that they offer as they press on from traditionally acceptable boundaries. Whatever your position may be though, the curiosity of many people, including children, has driven scores of people to experience and uncover the truth about the following dark moments in gaming. And so, the following list includes four games that were designed to be inclusive of younger audiences, and yet, provided us all with dark tones that would leave many curiously seeking out these morbid details. Number 4 The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time is a 1998 action-adventure video game developed and published by Nintendo for the Nintendo 64. The game is an action-adventure game with various role-playing and puzzle elements set in a somewhat open-world environment. The player sets out on an expansive adventure with the series protagonist, Link, collecting items and weapons as he navigates and completes dungeons to advance the story. Each dungeon is a self-contained area in which Link solves puzzles, defeats enemies, and does battle with a dungeon boss. The Ocarina of Time, through a series of unlikely events, sees Link gain access to the power of time travel. As such, Link travels back and forth through time, setting out to rewrite history in order to save the world from the evil emperor, Ganondorf. During the course of Link's many adventures, he stumbles across various locations, which typically feature child-friendly environments. From ranch-like homesteads to small city life, most of the Ocarina of Time is played with a great sense of adventure and zeal as Link sets out to conquer an evil emperor and restore the kingdom. However, during one of Link's many adventures, while traveling through time, Link stumbles across a familiar kingdom now gripped by darkness. The eerie music coupled with a ghostly wind makes for an extremely creepy ambience. But this is not the only strange thing within the now dark kingdom. As Link has now traveled through time, many of the inhabitants of the kingdom have become subject to the darkness of Emperor Ganondorf. And upon arrival to this kingdom, Link is confronted with the lost and now seemingly zombified residents. 
The zombified residents, also known as the Redead, feature an ability to shriek at the player, fixing Link in place, before jumping on Link's back and thrusting in an almost sexually explicit manner as they begin to try to choke out Link. As the player begins to try to ward off these foul ghouls, occasionally he or she will strike down one of these enemies, upon which the Redead begin making their way over to the now vanquished kin and set themselves down beside them. During this process, Link is completely ignored, and the Redead, they begin to crouch next to their fallen partner, before the body simply vanishes. Although never explained by gaming developers, some explanations for this behavior are that the Redead are mourning the loss of their comrade, and another more sinister explanation for this behavior suggests that the Redead are consuming the fallen kin in an act of ghoulish cannibalism. As a Nintendo fan myself, and as a huge Zelda fan, playing through this part of the game as a kid certainly gave me chills. Between the ambient music, hollow wind, and Redead attempting to seemingly rape you, it was always a place I tried to avoid. And now understanding the possible implications of the death ceremony of the Redead, it certainly adds an extra element of creepiness to the game. Number 3 Maniac Mansion is a graphic adventure video game in which the players use a point and click system to point characters through a two dimensional game world to solve various puzzles. The player starts the game by choosing two out of six other characters to accompany the game's champion, Dave Miller. The game can be won with any number of characters, but since many puzzles are completed only with particular characters, different decisions on the group's makeup will allow for greater completion of the game. The game takes place in the mansion of the Edison family. With the exception of a few personalities, the mansion's inhabitants are hostile in nature and will throw the player's characters into a dungeon or kill them if they see them. When a character dies, the player must choose a replacement from the characters yet to begin their journey through the mansion, and the player loses if all characters are killed. Although some features of the game are considered somewhat mildly creepy, such as some of the monsters located within the mansion, for the most part, upon release, the game was considered to be appropriate for all ages of gamers. As such, Children from all over the world purchased the game and hastily set out to explore and conquer the Edison family's mansion. However, unbeknownst to many responsible parents, in the process of the game's creation, a particularly morbid detail was overlooked by programmers. And, as a result, the game featured a bug of sorts. This bug, also known as the hamster glitch, sees one particular feature of the game that allows a player to cook a hamster in a microwave. After the animal cruelty is underway, and upon cooking the hamster, the player is then able to feed the hamster to one of the mansion's personalities. As the player goes through with feeding the hamster to this character, the character begins to complain, and after a short amount of time, realizes that he's eating his own pet. It wasn't long after the release that Nintendo caught wind of this special feature, and by this time, countless children had taken advantage of it. Nintendo soon demanded that the producers fix the content within following shipments. To my knowledge, although developers were commissioned to fix this glitch, no future versions of the game were ever made. As a result, the hamster glitch, or microwave and animal simulator, remains embedded within the minds of kids and generations past all over the world, even today. Number 2 Earthbound is a role-playing video game co-developed by Ape Inc. and HAL Laboratory for the Super Nintendo. The game features the young hero Ness along with his party of four as they travel the world to defeat the evil alien Gygus. Earthbound implements many traditional RPG elements. The player controls a party of characters who travel through the game's two-dimensional world comprised of various landscapes. 
As the player makes their way through the world, they encounter battles with various enemies, to which the party receives experience points for victories. As Ness and his crew continue their adventure, they level up, gaining more power as they make their way to the final boss, and through various plot twists and multiple battles with the underlords of Gygus, Ness and his cohorts eventually travel back in time to defeat the grand nemesis of the world. The battle with Gygus is known for its feeling of isolation, incomprehensible attacks, buzzing static, and reliance on prayer, all of which make for a feel for a terribly dark master boss battle. But if this wasn't chilling enough, it is what is left unsaid that has left many players with a bad taste in their mouth. The writer of the Earthbound series, Shikasato Aitoi, claimed that the inspiration for the game's plot, and specifically for the final battle with Gygus, came as a result of Mr. Aitoi's viewing of an old mystery murder movie. The movie's morbid title is known as The Military Policeman and the Dismembered Beauty. When viewing the movie, Mr. Aitoi interpreted a particular lovemaking scene from the movie into a scene of a young woman being raped by a river. The movie does not actually feature a rape scene. However, with the movie featuring a rough sex scene, followed by the woman being dismembered, it is easy to see how Mr. Aitoi could interpret the movie in such a way. This interpretation of this scene, Mr. Aitoi states, is what motivated his plot for Earthbound, and specifically, for the Gygus battle. Coupled with Mr. Aitoi's interesting admission for inspiration, the final boss scene, which may I remind sees Ness travel back in time, features strange visuals of Gygus as a red-faced wisp-like creature. The imagery, coupled with the information mentioned earlier, has led many to believe that the final boss fight sees Ness attempting to abort the dark alien Gygus in utero. And with the Japanese prequel version of the game peculiarly titled Mother, also featuring a mother-child-like relationship between the final boss and a queen, I must admit, the theory does actually make some sense. Perhaps this explains the submersive water and void-like music that accompanies the final battle between Ness and Gygus. And this may explain why the final boss within the prequel, Mother, is defeated by subduing the boss through a lullaby, ultimately overwhelming the boss with a sense of deep appreciation for the queen's motherly love. Although no admission or refutation of the theory has been forthcoming from Mr. Aitoi, it certainly is troubling to think that the final boss battle potentially features an abortion being carried out within a game made for children. Number 1 Undertale is a role-playing video game created and published by indie developer Toby Fox. Within the game, Players control a child and complete various objectives and puzzles to progress through the story. Players explore an underground world of towns, villages, dungeons, and characters. The underground world is the home of monsters, many of whom can be challenged in combat. These monsters are a large feature of the game, and players must decide in an ethical dilemma whether or not to kill or befriend them. Undertale is set within the realm known as the Underground. According to the game's lore, the monsters located within the Underground were once equal to humans and even dwelt on the surface with humans. However, after war broke out between humans and monsters, with humans as the victors, the monsters, they were banished to the Underground, where they remain in the game's present time. The game begins with a human child falling into the underground. This child is the player's main character. The player soon encounters Flowey, a sentient flower who teaches the player how to fight. Unknown to the player though, is that Flowey is about to attempt to murder the player before the adventure even begins. Fortunately for the player though, they are rescued by a monster named Toriel, who teaches the character how to solve puzzles and survive conflict in the underground without killing others. However, 
She also reveals her intentions to adopt the player and have them live with her in the ruins forever. This, the player is told, is to protect the character from the king of the underground. The game's tone is difficult to explain due to the complexity of every in-game character's unique personality, but perhaps this is what has drawn so many people to the game. From comical moments with the alleged enemies of the game to a host of personas that bring flair and ambience, the game really is a fun and fantastic experience for most who play it. But not every player's experience is the same. Throughout the game, the player has to make many decisions which ultimately impact on the storyline of the game. Most people play the game with a certain amount of empathy involved as they work with in-game characters making their way to an ending. One such decision is the choice a player must make when they enter into each battle. The dilemma each player is faced with is whether or not the player will show mercy to monsters or destroy them in their wake during encounters. And this brings us to a certain decision-making route within the game known as the genocide route. Given that the game is made up of many unique and individualized likable personalities, the sense of psychological attachment that is achieved with different in-game personalities is very real for a lot of people who play Undertale. The genocide route spins the notion of empathic decision-making on its head as the player sets out to destroy every unique personality in a dark, sociopathic-like inclination. Disturbingly, the game offers a set of implications for the genocide route also, and not one typically associated with punishment. In fact, much of the genocide route appears to bring in a sense of curiosity for many as the game provides people with different endings. As the player triggers various encounters with monsters in the world and begins destroying every living thing within that area, the game's tone begins to become much more morbid. From encounters that have battle text pronouncing, but nobody came, to distorted and eerie soundtracks, the game begins to shift into a darker psychology. Coupled with this, as the player continues to lower the number count of existing monsters, the world begins to gain a sense of isolation as monsters seemingly attempt to avoid the player. And with a series of pleas and warnings from some of the characters to relent from ending the world, to jump scares being played as the player sends the world to eternal destruction, what was once a seemingly innocent and fun game has become the outworking of something akin to the hellish mind of a sadist. The sense of sadism and isolation is truly unique within this game, as players often revisit their once attachment figures within a childlike two-dimensional framework now hellbent on destroying these attachment figures in order to gain access to desired alternate endings. And with so much of the motivation for Undertale still being explored, Undertale, and more specifically the genocide route, certainly pushes the psychological barriers of traditional gaming. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. Well, I hope you enjoyed this creepy countdown guys. And you know, all week I was trying to think of a Zelda pun to use for this video, but in the end, I just decided that I didn't want to try and force it. <laughs> Get it? Try and force it like Triforce. <laughs> all you Zelda fans out there, you guys are going to get that one and think that that was pretty good, but for everyone else, you guys are just going to facepalm again, so <laughs> I've just come to embrace the facepalm, I think. Anyway... <laughs> As always guys, it would be awesome if you could like, share, comment and subscribe if you're new. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for updates throughout the week. You can also catch me on my second channel, all of which have links in the description below. Also, before I leave off today, I do have a question for all of you for the comment section below. And it's sure to cause a bit of a comment war, I'm sure. So, who is the best Smash Brothers character and why? Thanks again for always tuning in guys and for all the love and support and I'll see you mates in the next one.